and the world is happening on Wall Street. Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. How are you doing there? Welcome to the David McWilliams podcast, the podcast that aims to make economics comprehensible, less complicated, and ultimately more relevant. Now, this week we're going to talk about the China-US trade wars, and it's now US-Mexico as well, could be US the rest of the world, but particularly the Chinese aspect. But we're going to do it through the lens of history and through the angle of seeing the world from other people's eyes. Before we begin, I want to just mention that this episode is brought to you thanks to our Patreon supporters. And to help support the content, and perhaps more importantly, to unlock exclusive comment and scenes and footage and episodes, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. As always, I'm joined by my own mate, John Davis. How are you, man? Very good. Listen, how was your week? I was away. Trump was here. What was that all like? (laughs) Yeah, when you were away, uh, Trump snuck in the back door and landed in Shannon. And uh, he was he was remarkably well behaved. But I have to say, he went down for a round of golf down in Doombeg. Go on. Trump, in fairness to him, employs most of the village of, of Doombeg. But the two Trump boys went on a pub crawl and... Did they get guillot? Oh, no, I doubt it. But they were buying drinks for everyone. I, do you know what? I bet they didn't even pay their bar bills. But anyway, but, but given the way all... the Alpha defaults on his companies, it's probably it's, it's a <laughs> it's a, you know, I mean. But what what struck me about it was is it this just... Donald Junior. Donald Junior. and Eric. Donald Junior. who uh, I think his nickname was Beach Ball, as sharp as a beach ball. <laughs> I don't believe he was the smartest tool in the in the Trumpian I, box, yeah. which means pretty yeah. good. So go on with it. They go on the gargle in and. Uh, but all the locals there, so they're buying all the locals. But it just smacked of, you know, back in the, the 19th century Ireland. You know, the big landlord comes along and they're all over him like a, like a cheap oh, suit. Oh, I know. I know, the Gumbians. Yeah, and it was kind of embarrassing. Oh, well, I, I, look, the funniest thing is there is always in Ireland this thing of the Gumbian man. I love that expression, actually, a yeah. Gumbian. And in my granny's lexicon in West Cork, <laughs> the worst thing you could be was a Gumbian, right? <laughs> because it came with all this colonial... Yeah, angst and fear and hatred, and you know the interesting thing is we're gonna I'm gonna bring you a podcast I did with my old mate Marla Ducaran, amazing economist down in Trinidad. All right, but the Trinidadians have exactly the same post-colonial mentality with respect to the big power, with respect to the big guy, even with respect to the white guy. Yeah, it's really interesting. And I asked her about it, and she said, "Look, it comes from being colonized. It comes from being." The Indians were taken over there as indentured slaves and servants. The blacks themselves were slaves. The whites were and were were rich, and the Brits ran the place. But they've been colonized by everybody down there. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think it's similar, and it, I know what you mean about the. I didn't. I didn't see it. I mean, yeah. my my trip was beautifully planned. I actually took <laughs> off about five minutes before he arrived yeah. last Wednesday, and I came home yesterday about five minutes after he left. So right. I think he planned it like that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It was really, really fascinating. And the interesting thing, John, today we're going to talk about the trade war and China, et cetera. Yeah. But the interesting thing about going to places like Trinidad, traveling a wee bit, sometimes it gets a bit of a pain in the arse after a while. You spend yourself, you have a horrible moment when the fellas at Dublin Airport, not the immigration fellas, the fellas checking you through at... uh, Right. They say, Jays, you're here again. Did you ever go home? (laughs) (laughs) That's what I got the other day. But it does allow you see the world kind of upside down from other people's perspectives. And I think when we're talking about the trade war with China and the United States and any issue of global economics, it's really important to see the world from the other side. Yeah, absolutely. And we never do. Yeah. No, no, you're absolutely right. And uh, it's so easy to get caught in that kind of echo chamber of the same Western media, the same Western kind of message, whether it's European or America, and you're absolutely right. It's one of the reasons why I love flicking through all the various different news channels. It's just getting a slightly different take or perspective uh, on, on the world. But go on, tell us more about so, it then. So let's, we're going to talk about the trade war, but I want to go back to a couple of months ago. This is about seeing the world in other people's eyes. 
I was in Russia, just around St. Patrick's Day. And I was sitting with Russian friends of mine, because you know I went over to learn Russian years ago, yeah. like, like all that part of the world. Anyway, <laughs> and they were talking about Brexit. The Brexit thing came up. And really interestingly, two of these Russians said they compared Boris Johnson, who will be the leader of the Tories, it looks like, and will be the Prime Minister of the UK. But they compared Boris Johnson to Mikhail Gorbachev. And I thought that was really unfair because we thought that Gorbachev was a great oh, liberator. Gorby, yeah. And I actually interviewed Gorby years ago. Did you? Yeah, yeah, I met him and interviewed him for a TV3 show I did years ago. So what was he like? He was, I mean, you know, it's a funny thing when you interview people, the things that stay with you. He seemed to me to be very, very soft and had extraordinarily soft eyes. And by that, I mean, no, it's really interesting. When you yeah. meet somebody, you don't expect. So you, you think, how is this is Mikhail Gorbachev? What am I going to remember from him physically, yeah. emotionally? He seemed like an incredibly soft, genuine, sincere person. But he was also, at the time, going through massive bereavement. His wife, who had been Raisa, who'd been beside him all through these... yeah areas and all through this convulsion in Russia had just died. So he was he was in mourning at the time, but he was he was fascinating. Jeez, person. could we dig that out? Yeah, we can definitely dig it out. How's your Russian? It's all in Russian. Oh, simultaneous right. no but it's all it's simultaneously translated. So we could we could definitely right. dig that out. Actually let's do that. But anyway, they said to me, we think Johnson is like Gorbachev. And I said, how do you mean? And they said Boris Johnson like Gorbachev has no sense of responsibility in what he's doing. So by going for Brexit, by advocating his own worldview, by backing himself, by potentially allowing Britain to break up, by potentially allowing Britain to be a pariah state, by potentially orchestrating a massive move into a sort of an uncharted water, he's very like Gorbachev. And I said, how do you mean? They said, look, Gorbachev mm. had this great idea called mm. Western democracy but he had no idea of how to get there. He was all rhetoric and no detail. And when it actually happened, when he unleashed the forces that were there in Russian society, in the Russian economy, in the Soviet military industrial complex, when he unleashed those forces, he had no way of controlling them. And Russia went into 10 years of chaos. Now think of this is the country that won the Second World War. It's a big country. Yeah. 10 years of chaos, of kleptocracy, of the oligarchs, of Yeltsin, and then who emerges? Putin, and they've had Putin for the last 20 years. Yeah. So they said that they thought Johnson's the same type of person, that in order to advance his own cause, he unleashes these forces. He has no idea where Britain is going. He has no idea how to get there. He has no idea of anything other than, will this play out for me? And I thought, again, it's coming back to this idea, you've got to see the world through other people's eyes. So the Russians dislike Gorbachev intensely, even though the West likes him. They really can't yeah. stand him. And they can't stand him because they believed he was like a showman rather than a leader. Yeah. And that Russia needs to be led by somebody very strong yeah. who plays chess. In fact, they described, it was really interesting how they described Gorbachev. They said Russian leaders should play chess and Gorbachev was playing Monopoly. <laughs> I thought it was a great, great yeah, description, really right? And they said, Johnson's the same. Yeah. And again, what is interesting, it kind of irked me because I was one of those people, and I was there during the Gorbachev years, I was learning mm. Russian there, that loved Gorbachev and thought that he was a He was really... seen as the progressive. Exactly. So, 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 so they... it's this idea that they, they basically perestroika yeah. is Brexit for communists. I love that. That's you know? great. But so were they not into perestroika? Or were they just not into Gorbachev? The idea, the, the idea was good, but it was badly executed, or they just weren't into the. the no, the thing. idea was good. So take it to the Brexit, right? Because the Brexit negotiations. So mm. you know, if Johnson becomes leader, right? That's what they were talking about. The Russians were saying to me, back in 1989, Gorbachev, like Boris Johnson, was driven by vanity and didn't understand the forces he was unleashing, and those forces destroyed the Soviet Union. And it's interesting, this is the 30th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm. And we see the fall of the Berlin Wall as a great thing. Yeah. But if you're a member of the Soviet apparatchiks, if you remember the Soviet system, this is a great defeat for you. And we forget that sitting 
in Unterden Linden in the Soviet embassy, about 400 yards from the Brandenburg Gate, about 450 yards from the Berlin Wall, was one KGB officer called Vladimir Putin who saw it all. Yeah. And it's the fall of the wall and the destruction of the Soviet Union that informs Putin's new Russia. He's 20 years in power in August. People forget it. He's been in power for 20 years. So 30 years ago, the wall falls. The first 10 years under Yeltsin is total chaos. You get the oligarchs, the mass, mass robbery of the oligarchs of the Soviet economy. Mm -hmm. You get the collapse of the ruble, the collapse of the banking system, total chaos economically. Then the the guy who was in his late 20s, early 30s, who watched the wall fall from the Russian embassy, Soviet embassy, Mm. comes into power and says, that shit ain't going to fucking happen again. Yeah, and he famously had hard, cold eyes, uh, according to Bush. Really? (laughs) We're 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 doing an eye thing. (laughs) But anyway, so I want to come to the trade war through the context of history. Because I believe that we rarely give history, economic history, enough yeah. credence and stature when we're discussing big events like today. So where does where does the China thing come into this? Then? So 1989, Putin is watching the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet economy, the collapse of the Soviet system, triggered by an irresponsible politician, Gorbachev, playing with fire and not understanding what he's doing, like Boris Johnson now. Simultaneously, in June of 1989, you have Tiananmen Square. Okay? In June of 1989, you also have East Germans beginning to flee before the Berlin Wall falls. Putin seeing all this. We look at Tiananmen Square as an outrageous slaughter of innocents by the Chinese military, yeah, directed, by the poli- directed by the Politburo. They, in 1989, looked at Gorbachev's democratization idea. They looked at Gorbachev's idea of, don't worry, it'll be all fine, we'll have slogans. And they said, the Chinese say, this is not going to happen to us. Why? Because we can see that the West are actively encouraging all these democratic movements, Mm. all these nationalist movements, the destruction of the Soviet Union. This ain't going to happen to us. So they made a choice then. And the choice was, if we are weak and if we descend into chaos, the West will pick us off as they are doing to the Soviet Union right now. I understand that way of thinking, but like barreling into Tiananmen Square, all guns blazing, and gunning down, what was it, 4,000? Who knows? Could be four, could be five. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. not I'm not saying... Maybe there's a better way of doing it. No. But anyway, that's no, kind of beside uh, yeah, the point. Absolutely, but if, you, if, you, if you think of like, what we were saying about Boris Johnson and Gorbachev, it's this idea that, you know, Brexit or perestroika is Brexit for communists, right? It's the beginning of a process that leads to the destruction of the state. Yeah. If you look from the Chinese Politburo and you think, okay, we have a choice here. We can risk going down this Western democracy and we can cave into these demands and begin a process that we've just seen has destroyed the Soviet Union. Yeah. Or we can reindustrialize China under our control, this idea of state capitalism. Mm. Okay. So we don't want this Western capitalism. We want capitalism, but we don't want it fragile. We want it strong. Why do we want it strong? Because if we're weak, those Westerners, the Brits, the Americans, all particularly the Americans, will take all the good bits of our economy through privatization, for yeah. example, which is exactly what happened in Russia. Where do all the oligarchs live? They don't live in Russia. They live in England or in the United States or in yeah. Israel. They've yeah. got out, right? So let's look at today's trade war, America versus China, through the lens of recent Chinese history, but through also the lens of Russian history and through the angle of Asian economic history. And this is the interesting thing. So if you talk to Chinese people, if you hear what Chinese kids learn in school, okay, and there's an amazing woman called Lenora Chu at the Doki Book Festival who has a great, great book called Little Soldiers, which is about her kids being educated in China. One of the things they learn about is the great trade war called the Opium War. 
And this is where it all starts. This is where the Chinese view of Western materialism and Western commercial... This is 1840s. 1840s. Yeah. Yeah. So the Opium War is an extraordinary episode. Britain wants to get into China. It wants control of the Chinese silk. It wants control of the Chinese garment industry. It wants to be able to trade with China. The problem is the Chinese don't want anything the Brits are making. They're not interested. They've got their own technology. It's quite not half as advanced, but they don't want any English consumer goods, right? So the Brits think this is no good because we want their stuff. So what are we going to do? And amazingly, what the British did is they flooded, think about this, they flooded China with heroin as a pharmaceutical product. Not only did they flood China with heroin, where did they get the heroin? They got the heroin in the Raj, in Afghanistan, which they they ruled, yeah. in Pakistan, which they ruled. So they harvested poppies, turned it into opium, brought that opium to China, and flooded China with cheap opium in order to make junkies of the Chinese. Shocking. This has all it's happened. absolutely shocking. <laughs> it's extraordinary. To make junkies of the Chinese so that China would be weakened by a massive, massive drug addiction problem in its population. And the British succeeded in creating about 14 million Chinese junkies until the Chinese said, we're not having this. And then when the Chinese decided to stop the importation of opium, the British, who at the time were, remember in the the famine, laissez-faire, you can't interfere with the free market, said, you are interfering with the free market. We are going to punish you for interfering with the free market. And the British Navy did what they always did. They arrived up on the coast in Shanghai and Hong Kong, and they bombed the shite at the Chinese, right? Because they were militarily much more sophisticated. This brought the Chinese to the table, okay? The, The Brits with the French invaded China brought the Chinese to the table, humiliated the Chinese. The Chinese had to sign trade agreements, which basically gave away everything and got nothing back. And the period 1840, late 1840s Mm. to the late 1940s, was the fall of Shanghai and the fall of nationalist China, is known and taught in China as the century of humiliation, where they were humiliated by Western powers. And this is what the kids are learning. This is what Chinese kids learn. So So this idea that the Chinese are kind of amenable to the Brits to do a trade deal is bullshit. Yeah. But they learned this. They learned, if you are weak, this is what happens to you, Yeah. right? But interestingly, and let's do another little page in this chapter of trade wars between Asia and the United mm. States. The Opium War was reported on in the West as Britain exercising its right to implement free trade on this bunch of Asians, Right. In Japan, across the Chinese Sea, the Japanese, who have been closed for 200 years after they kicked out the last of the Jesuits, right? Yeah, yeah. They, I think they killed about 300,000 Christians as well, because the Christians got a toehold. The Dutch... They killed 300,000? The Portuguese brought Christianity to Japan through the Jesuits. And the shoguns at the beginning of the 17th century, the warlords said, these people have been too powerful their allegiance is to a false god called Jesus Christ that we don't recognize. Yeah. And they beheaded them all. So they're a bit like the Taliban. They're very, exactly like the Taliban. They're yeah. exactly like the Taliban. So they didn't have the weakness for Toyota Jeeps, <laughs> which I'm always fascinated by. You know, the Toyota Jeep, the, 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 the Taliban has a weakness yeah, yeah, for a Jeep. Are, those Toyota Jeeps are everywhere. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. In, in, any, in, in any dodgy yeah. area. Whether it's Afghanistan, it's because you know it's because they're so incredibly reliable. Exactly. Yeah. You know, exactly. You know. So, I wonder did they whip off? You know, they they take peel off the letters that they just left it yo. At, yeah, and the- <laughs> exactly. But I mean, the interesting thing is, I, I noticed that I was in South Africa recently that the the Afrikaner has a weakness for the opened top Toyota Jeep as well. Yeah. So it's it's all sorts of creatures. But let's go back to Japan and let's again look at the trade war today through the context of history. So the Japanese are looking at what happened in the trade war, the opium wars, and they're thinking, we're a sitting duck. This is in 1850 in Japan, right? And the reason the 1850s are an important year is because the Japanese initially thought they were a sitting duck for the British. The British would just sail up to Japan and say, Mm. do you know what? We want some of your stuff and we're going to do the same thing. 
But coming from the other side is America. Now, we forget that, you know, all that stuff about the Alamo and everything, Davy Crockett, right? Yeah. Was basically America against Mexico. That was the war. Right. But when those the United, 1840s as well. When the United States won those wars against the Mexicans, it wasn't that they got the Alamo in Texas. That was all Hollywood stuff. What they actually got was California. Because California is, you know, Los Angeles, San Francisco, these were all Mexican towns. Yeah. And when you get California, you get the Pacific Coast. So suddenly the United States had an Eastern Navy patrolling New York, Boston, all the way down to Savannah, Georgia, and a Western Navy patrolling the Pacific. And that Western Navy does what navies always do. They go for a a jaunt. They take over Hawaii. They say, oh, look at all these lovely, nice little Hawaiians. You know, they they portray this as the the, great American states. But do you know what happened? The Americans took it over. Yeah. Kicked the shite out of the locals, right? Yeah. And then they're going towards Japan. So it was America that the Japanese were worried about. And in 1857, an American fleet under a fellow called Commodore Perry sailed into the Bay of Tokyo with six steam-powered military frigates. And the Japanese, who didn't even have steam power at the time, realised they are going to do to us what the English did to the Chinese. And China is a much bigger country than us, much more ancient history, much bigger potential military. They are now supplicants to these Westerners. Yeah. This is going to happen to us unless we change. And this is the moment that Japan changes. And this is Japan's Tiananmen Square moment. So the moment that China changes 30 years ago and says, we are not going to go down the Russian route, we are not going to be exposed and exploited by the West, we're going to put together state capitalism, and we are going to get strong. So how did they do that? So the Japanese did exactly the same. The Japanese said, okay, we're miles behind these people militarily. We are massively exposed. We have this crazy shogun system of feudal lords who run the country. The emperor is on the throne, but he is not powerful. He is only really genuflecting to the warlords. So we've got to change everything. And these were Japanese bureaucrats that came up with this. It's really interesting stuff. Mm. And they came up with something called the Meiji Restoration, which was in 1860. Mm. So Meiji was the emperor, okay? Okay. So it was the restoration of the emperor in power as the divine leader of Japan. To do that, they had to do two things. One is they had to destroy the shoguns, which was the feudal lords yeah. who basically owned the peasantship, owned the peasantry, yeah. in like, like, in the, like in the Russian cases. But they were a militia though, so they must have been hard to deal with. They, were, they had to destroy them, take away their power, and re-industrialize at the same time. Yeah. Okay? All under the umbrella of a defensive strategy to make sure that when the West came for them, as they'd come from the Chinese, that the Japanese would be ready to fight. Okay. So what they did was extraordinary. The the Japanese, they did deals with the Americans to buy time. So unlike the Chinese, they did say, okay, you can trade with us and et cetera. But that was all to do with buying time so Japan could become strong. They industrialized at a rate never, ever seen in modern history. Much more so than the Industrial Revolution, much more so than the German Industrial Revolution with the Japan industrialization under the Meiji Restoration because they had no industry. Yeah. And they So this is over, what, 30, 40 years? From 1860 to 1900. So 40 40 years. This is all going on, right? Yeah. Okay, it's a totally different playbook. And it's the playbook that the Chinese replicated in the last 30 years. Okay, This is the interesting thing. Yeah. It's the playbook. So the Japanese, they sent out, and this is like, you know, when we talk about, you know, espionage and the Chinese copying goods, Japanese copied everything. Yeah exactly the same as the Chinese did. They sent out their engineers, their salesmen, their students, their diplomats. They got all sorts of secrets from the West, military secrets, industrial technology, They brought them back to Japan and they copied everything Mm. to create the Japanese power. So for example, they did things like, they said, who's got the best Navy in the world? The Brits, we follow their Navy. Who's got the best army in the world? It's not the Brits, it's the Prussians. We follow their thing. So they took the best everything exactly as the Chinese are doing right now. Why? To be in a position that you're defensively Mm. strong because they saw when you're weak, as the Chinese were, in the open war, you'll be destroyed. Yeah. And the Chinese now said, when you're weak, what will happen is what happened in the Soviet Union. No matter how strong you look, if you're weak, the West will take you apart. The Japanese back then also said, when you're weak, you'll get destroyed. So they have this extraordinary industrialization 
And of course, diplomatically, exactly what China's doing now, mm. the entire strategy was based on always avoiding a conflict with the West. That's what China's been doing, right? And then when we're ready, we might have a conflict. In 1905, the Japanese were ready. The Russians blunder into a war with Japan in the Pacific, and the Japanese hand their Slavic arses to them on a plate. Okay? <laughs> and the world wakes up. It's yeah. like, there is a power in Asia that is not only able to beat us militarily, but industrially is incredibly powerful. It's the first time ever. First time ever. And this sends a massive shockwave around yeah. the West. Because up until then, since Christopher Columbus got into his boats in Cadiz, from that day in 1492 to 1905, an indigenous Asian or American population had never beaten the white man once. Mm. And now they did. And that's what the Chinese yeah. saw in 1989. They said, we have to reindustrialize like Japan. So they're doing exactly the same thing now. Exactly the same thing. So so make sense of that. Okay. Of the, the, the historical view to now. What's happening right now? So right now, China in 1989 said... Tiananmen Square is a price worth paying to reindustrialize, to become strong, so that when the showdown with America comes, because it's going to come, because mm. history tells us it's going to come, we are ready. The model they take is Japan in the late 19th century. It's not about the West. You know, we always say, you know, you read these books and they say, oh, well, China will go democratic because that's the right thing to do. Yeah. It's bullshit. The model is Japan. It's an Asian model customized for China right now. State capitalism, where the state is in power, it allows the capitalist dynamic to flourish, but it's still very much a state-run system. Okay. To get strong, because when the day comes that the Americans decide to pull the trigger on a trade war with you, which is what the Brits did with the Chinese, what the Americans did with the Japanese in the past, you will be strong. So hold on there a second. So are you saying that Trump actually has been pretty smart in starting the trade war now before China yes. actually gets that yes. stronger position? Now, Jesus Christ. The great, the <laughs> unusual thing about Trump, right? I, it's so easy to say he's an idiot and he's a gobshite and he's a malignant narcissist and all mm. that stuff. But he manages on occasion, to stumble in to doing things that benefit him. This is what I'm saying. He kind of yeah. stumbles into these things. So if you look at Greek history, the major rivalry between Athens and Sparta was always that when a civilization is on the rise and it meets a civilization that is on the decline, that ultimately these two are condemned to fight. Yeah. The declining power, intimidated by the rising power, tries to put manners on them. Great example of this is the late 19th century. Britain on the decline, Germany on the rise. Yeah. Militarily, but mainly industrially, commercially. They eventually end up fighting in World War I. Same idea, on the rise. Now you have China on the rise, America on the decline, Trump or maybe Bolton or whoever's talking, they yeah. see this. And they realize that China is getting so strong so quickly that if we wait any longer, our position is going to be even weaker. So they stumble into the trade war. They realize that China's copying everything like Japanese copied everything. They realize the trade war is all about geopolitical, who's the top dog. And ironically, Trump's gut feeling of starting the trade war now is possibly the right feeling because what the Chinese really wanted was a Hillary Clinton government. Right. Because Hillary Clinton would have prolonged the GATT and open markets and trade. This would allow China to get stronger, stronger and stronger and stronger. Mm. And they'd be more ready like the Japanese were when the Russians attacked yeah. In 1905. So, so this has become a little bit too early from the Chinese. And it would suggest to me that Trump, despite all his buffoonery and his unpleasantness and his narcissism, 
his gut feeling about fighting the trade war now with China, in terms of timing at least, is probably right. Thanks so much for listening to the podcast. Now, if you like our content and you want to support us, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. If you become a patron, you can unlock all sorts of interesting new content, interviews I'm going to be doing, ticket giveaways for those interviews, those conversations with really interesting people, experiences that you can't get anywhere else. And this will ensure that the podcast remains ad-free and you can get all of this stuff for the price of a pint.